on the western side up to 12 metres. Just uh, yeah, add that one up in Kobar context. Don't tease. That's just me. <laughs> 12 metres per year. And as a result, you get a lot of erosion. And uh, on the western side, you've got rapid uplift. 5 to 10 millimetres a year uplift. Whereas on the eastern side, it's dry, there's very little erosion, and there's less than one millimetre a, a year uplift. So very strongly asymmetrical origin. And this is what it looks like from the point of view of hydrothermal systems, the red dots, the hot springs, very similar to the Himalayan ones and the Taiwanese ones, they're a bit cooler. Uh, none of these are boiling, so they're strictly speaking warm springs. And uh, the, in the orange there, right along the, the divide, there's uh, gold-bearing veins scattered right through those orange zones. They're, they're very small, but uh, the initiation of, of the Southern Alps uh, was down here in the Miocene, and uh, those ones have been mined. They're likely, likely quite rich, they're just fairly small. Well, you know what the magnetotelluric section looks like now, and this is what the Southern Alps one looks like. It's on a completely different scale. I mean, the spatial scale is, is similar to Taiwan, but the resistivity scale is uh, somewhat compressed. There are no brines here. These are much more dilute very much more dilute. And the, there's two notable things that come out of this. One is that the Alpine Fault, which is a major structure, has almost no fluid moving along. It does have a little bit of fluid moving along, but you can't see it with the magnetic tolerance section. Right? It's, it's in here. It's, it's, a, it's actually quite resistant. And this is of interest to looking at old belts as well, Going right back to the Archean in orogenic gold systems, they are close to, but not at, major structures. And in the Southern Alps, it's just the same. A few kilometres towards the east is where you find the gold. You can see the plume of water going up from depth, up under the, the AU there, which is the main mountain chain. So the gold, is under the main mountains, just like in Taiwan. We have the same sort of extension going on there. We can't quantify it quite as well as they have in Taiwan. And you know why that is? It's because everything is moving. And so to get a fixed point for the satellite to record all the time, and being sure that that hasn't fallen over or has slipped down the hill, is actually almost impossible in the southern mountains because every rock is moving. On the most they have to do it in Taiwan. All right, so there we have fluid moving up and moving gold around other than under the mountains. We can subdivide the uh, gold deposits, small though they are, we can subdivide them into three main types, three main styles. This is what I call metamorphic alteration. Metamorphic alteration, the fluids were essentially in equilibrium with Grinch's facets. So the fluids were moving pervasively through the rock, and here we've got arsenopyrite grains, quite big ones. I was at Fosterville the other day down near Melbourne, and uh, they have uh, rocks very similar to this actually. Arsenopyrite disseminated through the rock. There is some free gold, but most of the gold is associated with, with the arsenopyrite. And the important thing is that there is essentially no alteration here. Because the fluids were in equilibrium with Grinch's facies, chloride, delvite, muscovite, all, all quite happy. And we want to contrast that with the main type of alteration, anchoritic alteration, which is very similar to what you find at Bendigo, the, the big gold deposits at, at Bendigo with the veins. Anchorite is iron-bearing carbonate. It's really common 
down at Bendigo, and it's really common right throughout uh, the Southern Alps. The weather's brown, a bit of free gold here, but mostly it's sulfides within these uh, anchoritic quartz veins, and uh, they are fault hosted or fracture hosted right throughout uh, the main mountains. So that's probably the most common style of orogenic gold in the system. And the most common style in Taiwan is essentially identical. The anchorite comes because the fluid was out of equilibrium with the rock. The anchorite is it's a carbonate alteration of chloride, basically. So in this case, chloride has gone to anchorite, disequilibrium, and uh, you get anchorite precipitation in the host rock and in the veins, and gold and sulfide. And then the, the third type, at shallow levels, we get these uh, shallow, I call them shallow veins, with open cavities with prismatic crystals, agile area and quartz. It, it looks a bit like low sulfidation antithermal. Very, very similar to that. Uh, there has been boiling fluids within these. These, these things, we've actually dated these agile areas at about half a million years, give, give or take a bit. So we're talking about fairly rapid uplift and, and erosion and turnover. Uh, the, the quartz crystals, uh, some of the quartz crystals are this big, literally this big. So the extension that goes on within the, the mountains as a result of, even though they're compressional mountains, the extension that goes on because of that differential uplift, differential velocity, gives you huge cavities. And that allows the water to go in and move around. It's really good for uh, hydraulic, permeability, hydraulic permeability. It's still thinking. There we go. So this is putting it together, all in one diagram. We've got collision, tectonic convergence, a whole lot of dirt coming out here and being eroded away, rapid erosion. And under here we've got the, the powerhouse of essentially equilibrium, metamorphic alteration with uh, middle crustal fluid moving through here. Some of it may be uh, meteoric water that's come all the way down. Some of it is probably generated from the hydrous minerals at depth. And then as these fluids move up, they become out of equilibrium with the rock and uh, those disequilibrium and anchoritic alteration processes occur right almost to the surface. And then superimposed on them, uh, up at the top, we've got the shallow veins. There's not much gold in the shallow veins. You could draw a diagram like that for Taiwan, but of course the thing would be symmetrical because the wind comes from the south. Now where does the metals come from? That's uh, the, the question. Is, is there enough uh, source of metals? Well, th this is a set of analyses that was done right across the uh, schist belt in the right through the southern Alps Look, the, the rocks are very similar to the ones you've got here and they're all incredibly boring they all look the same so you, for a study like this that's really good because you can just go and analyze them. analyze them in terms of metamorphic grade low grade really low grade low grade high grade and highest grade and the arsenic is the the best signal there, arsenic in a, an ordinary low grade rock, about 10 parts per million, and by the time you get into Grinch's fasces, the upper part of the Grinch's fasces, it drops down to about one part per million, and this is over a lot of samples. Nine parts per million of arsenic doesn't sound like very much until you integrate it over the whole origin. That is a lot of arsenic lost 90% of it. Gold, you only lose about 30% of it. But nevertheless, 30% of the gold dispersed through an ordinary boring piece of Devonian slate, because this is what we're talking about, 30% of that gold taken over the whole slate belt is an awful lot of gold. An important point here that I alluded to before when I was talking about Taiwan is that in this system, I haven't got copper, lead, and zinc up here, 
But the reason is that they don't move at all in these fluids. You need the chloride that you have in Taiwan, that is present in Taiwan. Here, these fluids are much too dilute. And they're not going to move base metals. So there is a strong contrast here between the New Zealand one and the Taiwan one. The Taiwanese one, we expect to be able to move base metals. These ones, this fluid system here, we know doesn't move base metals. But it does move gold and arsenic and antimony and a bit of tungsten and some mercury. And these are the typical elements that you find in uh, origin gold deposits, like, like down in Indigo, Stall or whatever. So here we've got a, a system and it's sort of a conveyor belt. There's the magnetotelluric thing, image on the background. I'm just pointing out that the rocks are moving through at plate tectonic rates, about 5 to 50 millimetres a year. It's unlikely to be as slow as 5. Uh, in New Zealand it's, it's 40, in Taiwan it's 90. But you've got rocks moving in into the origin. Some of them go really deep, some of them go right through and get eroded and taken away. And as it the result of these processes, you get gold deposited in different settings, in different places, but they can be, they have a whole lot of different textures formed at the same time. So we can have, at shallow levels, we've got steeply dipping veins where the fluids are moving through the rock quite rapidly. At, at depth, we've got a metamorphic style where the fluid is moving pervasively through the rock. And then any rocks that are mineralized here eventually get transported out the end there and they will get metamorphosed. They'll get squished up and so you end up with a sheared gold deposit. They're all forming at the same time. And I just want to highlight here Right, we've got all types of mineralized things at, at the same time in, in a dynamic system. Now, the next point I want to make is that like Taiwan, we get superimposition. We have here, uh, at the northern end of the South Island, uh, strike slip faults. This is oblique convergence, that's pure strike slip up there. And the Marlborough faults are migrating uh, towards the southwest and always also to the south, I've just put on Christchurch there, uh, that makes it pretty immediate. All right, we're talking about uh, active tectonics, very active tectonics. So here we have a situation where the strike slip structures are being superimposed on the oblique convergence. And as a result, here's the gold belt that I showed before, it's the orange thing there. The hot spring belt has been captured now by the strike slip faults. The hot spring belt almost certainly used to go right along the, the Alpine Fault, sub parallel to the gold belt. But the northern part of that gold belt is dead now, and the main focus of hydrothermal activity at the northern end has changed into a strike slip system. And when you look at depth, you can see the contrast. This is, again, the magnetotellurics. This is the main part of the Southern Alps. Under Marlborough, instead of this dispersed gold under the main mountains, in Marlborough, the fluid is focused on the faults. We can't see any evidence for gold at the surface, but there is mercury, anomalous mercury, associated with the hydrothermal systems. And uh, the prediction is that there's gold being precipitated at, uh, at greater depth. And those rocks are not being uplifted. So we're not going to get to see those. So you have to take my word for it that there is gold uh, at depth there. But the important difference is that this is fracture controlled, <coughs> small faults. Up there, that's controlled. The whole hydrothermal system is controlled by major structures, spaced out something like 
20 to 30 kilometers apart. So that's very strong structural control. So once, once this system stops and gets eroded, take four, five, six, eight kilometers off it, you'll have dispersed gold at the southern end, and you'll have fault-hosted gold at the northern end. And there'll be a transition from one to the other. As well as this transition that I've been talking about in the South Island here, we've got the same sort of process that, that I was talking about in Taiwan with the epithermal system that's hosted in an extensional zone in the North Island, and that's migrating south. So just like in Taiwan, we expect here to get the orogenic deposits ultimately superimposed, have superimposed on them epithermal or porphyry copper systems. And there'll be magmatism as well. So the early gold, early orogenic gold, with later superimposed magmatism and uh, epithermal hydrothermal systems. Now all of that, because this is an old crust, all of that is superimposed on the pre-existing gold deposits. And I just want to throw past you the only big mine we have, which is the, the McRae's gold deposit there, it's Mesozoic, it's Jurassic, which is old for New Zealand. But that's an example of a deposit that was there pre-existing before the new plate boundary developed. And I'll just show a few pictures of that to uh, just show you what it looks like, I suppose. It's a metamorphic style of mineralization very similar to what I was talking about in the Southern Alps. That is, the fluid flow was essentially pervasive. It's about a nine million ounce deposit. Whether they can get all nine million ounces out is another matter, but they've got three million ounces out so far. One and a half grams on a good day. All right, and this is what a lot of it looks like. It's basically schist. It's slightly higher grade, slightly more uh, metamorphosed than your slate. These are porphyroblasts, and I was showing pictures before of uh, porphyroblasts of arsenopyrite from under the Southern Alps that is uh, of the order of half a million years old. This is Jurassic equivalent, same sort of thing. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, graphite micro shears here, but the metamorphic grade, or sorry, the the, yeah, the metamorphic grade is Grinch's fasces, lower Grinch's fasces, and the fluids that were moving through there were essentially in equilibrium, only very slightly out of uh, equilibrium with lower Grinch's fasces. So this is pretty much a metamorphic rock. It's a bit more deformed than a standard piece of, of that uh, schist, slate, call it what you want. Uh, this is almost myelolytic. All the dark stuff is, is graphite, a little bit of sulphide, and then the, the really black stuff up in the top there is a mixture of graphite, and gold, pyrite, and arsenic pyrite. This is very similar to uh, stuff that's at Fosterville. Remarkably similar. So going back to, to that picture, if you want to relate where McRae's style of deposit would form in a real origin, it's down here, say 10 to 15 kilometers, probably 10 to 12 kilometers. It's this metamorphic style of, of mineralization. And I just put this one to stir you up. It's metamorphosed and shared slates and sandstones. That's what it is. It's very hard to pick out. It's really, really subtle. The significance of it from the economic point of view uh, in Otago was that it changed Otago from a plaza province almost overnight to a hard rock province. Historically, Otago produced something like 8 million ounces of, of, of plaza gold, minuscule amount of hard rock gold. Now, we've got uh, 3 million produced and uh, 9 going on towards 10 million ounce uh, deposit, single deposit, uh, just 
sitting there. So it's a hard rock province now. And I just put this there to irritate you. How many of those are in your slate bill? It would be really, really hard to find them, but I bet they're there somewhere. You've got all of the ingredients. All right, so just to draw to uh, draw to an end with some conclusions, these are the things that you can be sure of about what was above us in the Devonian. All right, that these origins have high relief and abundant rainfall. It rained here quite a lot, not like now, and it's not flat like now. It rained a lot and it was high relief and uh, the, I don't know which way the wind was blowing. I'm going to say from the east, just uh, to see if you agree or not. But the, the asymmetry is controlled by the wind direction. There's rapid uplift, which gave elevated thermal gradients in certain parts without magnetism. There could have been magnetism, but you didn't need magnetism to give high thermal gradients and lots of fluid circulation. This extension under the mountains facilitates fluid flow. Really important because it means that gold and uh, magma can be in place uh, much more readily because of that permeability. Rocks move from one regime to another. So when you see compressional rocks with extensional overprint, all it is is moving a rock probably just a few kilometres from one regime to another. And origins have got finite, finite length and variable de deformation style and therefore de variable mineralization style along their length at the same time. And also one superimposed on the other. Here we go. Change along strike from orogenic to epithermal porphyry. Orogenic gold to accrue depth zonation. So I'm talking here about the metamorphic ones and I'm challenging you to find a McRae style deposit around here, and you probably don't need to because you've got mineral deposits coming out your ears. But nevertheless, it'd be interesting to see if there are any here. I talked a bit about inherited crustal structure. So <coughs> when the Lachlan was made, that was one event, but then New England got plastered on the outside. What happened then? We, we don't really know. And I want to leave you with this, this point here, horizontal motion in plate tectonic settings is, is really rapid. Five centimetres a year, which is pretty average, all right, for two million years, which is uh, less than the error in your dating for the Devonian, that gives you 100 kilometres of convergence. It's 100 kilometres of rock length by whatever thickness you want, 10, 15, 20 kilometres, by however wide you want to make your origin, that is an awful lot of rock that is being squeezed into one place. And this is what it looks like when it's happening. This is the Southern Alps, so it's uh, an asymmetrical one. But when that process is going on, you've got something like 10 tonnes per year of arsenic and a third of a kilogram of gold moving around in that block of rock there as a result of these processes. No magnetism, nothing up my sleeves, that's what happens. And we'll see if this works. There's an animation there, which I have to turn the lights off for. We'll see if it works. Yeah, there we go. So this is done for New Zealand, so we've got the, it's asymmetrical, raining on the, the western side. We're moving rocks, this is, these are structures, this is metavolcanic blobs, and they move in, they're just showing the, the whole lot moving in. This is this uh, rock moving in at uh, several centimetres a year, coming into the system like a conveyor belt. It's being spat out here and eroded away. But on the way through, it generates a whole lot of gold. And that's what those lightning bolts are, they're earthquakes, moving gold-bearing fluids from depth up to shallower levels and leaving the gold behind, and the arsenic, of course. And a lot of the gold is being eroded, and it's accumulating here as plastics. Now, this keeps on going. Of course, the, the gold ends up as in the sea again. 
you have to stop this at some stage, and of course all origins stop, and uh, once it stops it freezes, and you get left with what you get left with. So there'll be McRae style deposits at depth, and uh, steep vein styles at, up at shallow levels. But the important thing is that this is not just a pile of dirt that accumulates, goes down and comes back up again. This is a pile of dirt that's coming in at centimetres a year and it keeps on coming for millions of years. That's an awful lot of rock. And because it's an awful lot of rock, it's an awful lot of metals. This one's set up for gold because we don't have any brines. In Taiwan, same process, except it's symmetrical, and in that case, almost certainly, you move uh, base metals as well. Alrighty, so there we go. I'm happy to answer questions, or um, take tomatoes, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get horizontal zonation in the hill where, where the whole the gold is being deposited, like from right to left? In, um, in yeah, I, I think you will. Although it's mainly vertical, you don't start making gold until you get into. You, you've got to get rocks from here, take them down, and get them hot. And so the process of doing that is going to mobilise gold, and that's the sort of thing you're talking about, I suppose. It will uh, get uh, locally mobilised, but the main fluid flow zone is under the mountains here, and that's a vertical thing. So the horizontal thing, I'm, I'm not too sure about. It's not something I've thought about, actually. Although, uh, I have built into this. I'll turn the lights off again. I did build into this. A little bit of horizontal. Every now and again you'll see a lightning bolt go hurtling along here. And that may be the sort of thing you're talking about. At depth, when you've got high fluid pressure, the, uh, when you get an earthquake, the fluids are going to move horizontally. And you'll get horizontal veins. And that could give you a sort of a leading edge of gold out here. So you'll go from no gold into this leading edge of gold. But still, that uh, mineralised rock is going to move through the system, and some of it will get eroded. <coughs> That's not quite answering your question, and the reason is, is I can't.